Hello everyone, we have a very special video today. Over the years many people ask for an alternate history scenario from my channel and I always said I don't know enough and I think one person is definitely not enough and we need you need several specialists because there's so much going on if you want to do alternate history on a not shallow level. And so we prepared, we have Drachi Niffel, our naval expert and military aviation history of Bismarck as the, uh, as the aviation expert, of course. And we're gonna look at a situation where the Germans in 1940 go actually for a strategy in the Mediterranean, a more proactive version. So to keep it short, the historical situation is basically similar until the Battle of Dunkirk. But then, in our situation, Hitler recognizes that the British won't give in so easily. As such, he looks further and thinks, okay, we need to put the British out of the war. How can we do it? And he goes for a more proactive stance in the Mediterranean. Now, the historical situation was, there's different views on this. Most, some say Hitler ignored the Mediterranean. Others say this was not the case. The thing is, that say that he didn't ignore it, he looked at Mussolini, Franco and also Pétain because this was their sphere of influence and we will go in this scenario basically that he pushes, pushes further and that Mussolini and Franco and Pétain go mostly with it. So we won't discuss how he convinces them because like in at least October 1940 he suggested giving the Italians panzer divisions but the Italian general staff said, no, we want to do it on our own in North Africa. So we know at least that that happened. So basically now we're going to first with discussing the German strategy after the Battle of France. And the first one is here how, mu how much we keep in France to defend it. So for the army, the Luftwaffe and the Kriegsmarine. And then how much pressure the Germans still keep in France or in the Battle of Britain. And I think, so basically, let's start with the naval side for the Kriegsmarine. Okay. What do we need in this situation? So if you're going to go for a Mediterranean focus, a lot of the Kriegsmarine assets that are in France are obviously the U-boats trying to fight the Battle of the Atlantic. Now, a lot of those obviously are Type 7, Type 9 U-boats they're not quite as useful in the Mediterranean as, as they would be in the Atlantic. So most of those are probably still going to stay committed to that. And also you need to keep the pressure up on the British supply lines. Um, what the British found operating in the Mediterranean very quickly, because they brought a lot of uh, submarines back from the Far East, where they'd been training to hunt in the Pacific against the Japanese. And it turns out the kind of large, long range submarines that you use to hunt in an ocean when you take into a shallow, confined waters like the Mediterranean, they don't do very well. They've got longer dive times. They're much easier to spot from the air, even if they're submerged in shallow water. And so those submarines take quite a few losses. So the most successful British submarine types in the Mediterranean, the U-class, they're much smaller. So although the Type 7C, which was a slightly smaller variant of the Type 7, um, was relatively successful when it was deployed to the Mediterranean. So Ark Royal and Barham are both sunk by Type 7Cs, um, U81 and U331. But they, they still have issues operating there. So Kriegsmarine assets in France probably aren't going to be depleted that much. Um, they may send a few 7Cs over, but they did historically, so it's not a particular drawdown. What I suspect they would probably do if they're trying to focus more often would be the Type 2s because the Type 2s are historically small coastal submarines, mostly used for training, because outside of operating off the North Sea coast, they're not particularly useful. But in the Mediterranean, they're almost exactly what the, they would need. You've got, they're small, therefore they're hard to spot, they're faster diving. The fact they only carry five torpedoes on most variants doesn't really matter that much, cause, and the short range as well, because you can just come back and reload. Um, and so they're going to have a much greater survivability in the Mediterranean than something like a large Type 9. And we know that they did, via river and rail and road, transport some of them to the Baltic to operate against the Soviet Union. So they are land transportable. So I suspect you might have seen an increase in Type 2 production with them being shipped down either to the former Austro-Hungarian ports like they used in World War I or to Italian ports and then used from there. Um, in terms of surface assets, well, obviously the, the single big 
biggest problem is the Straits of Gibraltar. Um, it, it's even narrower than the channel and there's Force H sitting right there. So um, Force H in mid-1940 um, is probably at one of its strongest points because it's been reinforced. The British are worried at that point that the Italians are about to enter the war, which obviously they, they historically do. So you've got Hood is there, Valiant, Resolution, um, Ark Royal, and two, uh, two of the older cruisers, admittedly, and a destroyer flotilla. So that's a, that's a fairly substantial force. It's not something that the available Kriegsmarine units of the time, Chan, Horsk, and Eisenhower, are going to be able to realistically challenge on their own. Um, and there are ships swapping in and out as well when they, when they try and make Malta convoy runs and things like that. So occasionally there's like uh, other capital ships will be there. So to sum this up, basically in the Atlantic, the pressure is more or less the same like it was historically, but in the Mediterranean, we have a bit more pressure because we have coastal submarines basically. The yeah, two. coastal submarines, maybe a few Type 7 Cs infiltrating through Gibraltar, although they had historical issues doing that. Um, if the Germans want to deploy heavy surface units, they're going to run into two problems. One, obviously, is the fact the Italians don't have that much oil um, for their own fleet, let alone more of theirs. Plus, as I said, getting past Force H, there are scenarios where they could do that. Um, but the kind of scenario where they'd have to do that and the timing involved with the Italian fleet to pull, pull off a pincer is probably beyond the scope of what we're looking at in, in this, which is obviously more, more of a focus on the Mediterranean and not we're taking the entire Kriegsmarine and giving them a Mediterranean holiday. Okay, now for the Luftwaffe, there's of course the, the big issue, how much pressure is kept in Britain so that they're still more or less concerned about an invasion and can't pull out too much stuff to the Mediterranean or other areas. So what is your take on this, Bismarck? Um, so for the Luftwaffe, we essentially have to take the stance that the order of battle that they had for the Battle of Britain would be our force we could then redeploy. However, just what Rafinal has already said is that there has to be a certain amount of pressure kept up on the actual home isles in order to keep the RAF engaged there and I would assume also the Royal Navy perhaps. A force that we see deployed for the Battle of Britain, that's roughly 1,100 bombers and 900 fighters, we can still draw away from that force, but also to prevent the area from going more aggressive against German installations and also the German homeland, we still need a reserve there to keep things uh, relatively stable, let's say. The assumption that I would also go is that the increasing collaboration that the Luftwaffe, well, I wouldn't really call it collaboration because it was a little bit tricky, but that they had with the Kriegsmarine when it comes to hunting down the convoys in the Atlantic uh, and the first sort of um, attempts that were made into what eventually becomes the Fliegerführer Atlantic uh, would be also kept and that the forces that were deployed to Norway and Denmark would also be stay the same, um, just you know, to seal that area off essentially. Um, so if we look at the amount of planes that were actually deployed to the Mediterranean around December 1940 in the historical scenario, in the real scenario, um, we are talking about the Zehnte Fliegerkorps, and that is roughly 100 bombers, 80 Stukas, um, maybe 20, 30, 40 heavy fighters and real fighters. For, for context, the 10th Fleer Corps is the, focused on uh, anti-nail yes. anti shipping yes, operations. Yes, exactly. And this is a problem stuff. actually for the, uh, for the Luftwaffe at this point because anti-shipping is something that the Luftwaffe has not invested a lot of time in. Now, theoretically speaking, we can take a couple of more Kampfgeschwader from Luftwaffe 3 at this point. I think this would actually be doable. Um, and uh, from um, also some, some maybe Jagdgeschwader 2 or something will be deployed that also to the Mediterranean. The problem is the capacity of the Mediterranean airfields that we have, that the Italians have. Uh, when the Germans in the historic scenario go to Sicily, the airfields in Sicily are not big enough to keep this rather limited force that was already the Zehnte Flieger Corps um, adequately based. Uh, the airfields were overcrowded and uh, there was a lack of supply. Now, this redeployment can happen very quickly. Historically, the Luftwaffe did it in roughly four days. And the air uh, transportation assets that the Luftwaffe has at this point, it would be relatively enough to enable enough supplies to come in. However, like I said, the actual basis that the Italians have at this point, as well as we have to look at the potential of actually basing some Luftwaffe assets already in, the, in Italian Africa. Um, so that would be Libya, either around Tripoli or Tobruk. 
yeah, we're, we're talking about maybe an additional 100 bombers and then one, one group of uh, Jakeshwader or something to cover them. The problem is these are guys are not trained in anti-shipping. This is what is going to be the, their major role in this scenario. The only Kampfgeschwade that is really trained in a anti-shipping role at this point is KG-40. That would still be based in the Atlantic and uh, KG-26. And KG-26 is actually using torpedoes, which have not yet been cleared for combat operations. So they're using them, but they're not yet cleared because they keep having issues with them. Um, the, the story of the German aerial torpedo is quite a magnificent one, I would say. <laughs> um, I can't go into it right now. Uh, suffice it to say, they, they had one success, one specific success in Spain, and they didn't see the potential in it. And um, in the end, they actually had to import Italian torpedoes and get some Italian know-how in there to make their real torpedoes work. So I think if we just look at the Luftwaffe and we, we, can, we could potentially seal off just the north, keep in a relatively defensive, just a little bit of a stalemate, try to keep the RAF contained. If the RAF wants to be aggressive at this point, I think they wouldn't do it immediately, but they would maybe after a couple of months catch on. Production, of course, would be ramped up as well. But what would be interesting to see is how much can the RAF actually redeploy to the Mediterranean at this point, because the RAF is, since 1949, slowly starting to ramp up their effort there. They build up bases, uh, spare parts production even in, in Egypt, and they ferry in aircraft relatively quickly. Now, the problem is the aircraft that they have to ferry in, historically speaking, they actually went more or less around Nigeria and then had to fly through the African continent all the way up to Egypt. So there's going to be a lot of wear and tear, there's going to be a lot of losses on the way. Uh, the first couple of flights, they've lost you know, a horrendous number of planes on the way. About half of the fighters arrived on the third flight, first flight and maybe 20 to 30 percent of the actual bombers sent. And we're talking about Blenheims here. We're not talking about Lancasters or Halifaxes or something. We're talking about Blenheims. Um, you know, I like the Blenheim, but it's mm -hmm. not an ideal <laughs> plane um, for, for, for that uh, aspect. Um, so the big question is how much can the Luftwaffe very quickly establish itself in Italy, in Libya, and how much capacity is there on the Italian side to actually accommodate them? And I think this is a sticking point, yeah. because I don't see a scenario where we can really get the basis that the Luftwaffe would require to launch a consistent effort with less than what we have seen during the real war attrition. One issue is, of course, logistics, and I couldn't find a uh, determined answer here because one problem is the, the connection between Germany and Italy is rather thin on the railway side, and I know that Hitler mentioned to the Japanese am uh, ambassador that it's rather a bottleneck. The problem is I don't know if this was the truth or he just told the Japanese ambassador as a and an excuse for something, but we also look now more on the army. And I think for the Luftwaffe, we discussed this yesterday offhand a bit, for the Luftwaffe, the logistical side could be solved with the... With the uh, Kampfgruppen zur besonderer Verwendung. Which used transport planes and, and brought in some in, important stuff. Yeah. Now, <laughs> for, the, for the army, I had some, I found some very interesting information. For instance, uh, historically on the 21st of August, they actually, looked at sending a complete corps, a Schnelles corps, so a, a, a basically a panzer corps to a certain degree, to the Mediterranean, and they assumed it would take six weeks to get it more or less ready, but not completely combat effective. So we know, okay, it, it takes about six weeks to redeploy it. Of course, we're talking about, let's say, the, the armistice with France, so about the, everything would start to get in motion on the beginning of July. So we have at least to add here, okay, then we lose the complete July and mid of August, you could say, okay, we can ship now a complete Panzer Corps basically to the Mediterranean. Now, the next thing is how to get it over because it also takes, it was calculated for one division to, to about 42 days and I actually have the timeline how it finally took. It was the fifth light division, which was not a complete Panzer division, but almost. And basically, it was, is this the correct one? Yeah, the, the first shipping started on the 8th of February and they finished basically in early April, but it seems on the 10th of March already, they shipped nine out of 10 parts. This was quite interesting because I don't know why they took the whole of March 
then to finish up from the 10th to the 30th or something. And I think it's related to actually delivering a lot of supplies. So the, the most part of the division could be shipped basically from in about, yeah, one, one month. You could ship a complete division there. So you have one and a half month to get it ready or for a core at least, but let's say for a division in this case. So at best, the first time you would have it over is in mid-September. But I think we should add at least one month for licking the wound of the Battle of France, reorganization. Convincing also, Mussolini, convincing yeah, Frank. Yeah. Coming to the decision, because yeah. the Germans actually, in what, what, what happened in reality was basically, when Hitler decided in early January, they really did everything rather fast. But this was related because in October 1940, they already considered sending it there. And this is actually very interesting because back then they sent a, a panzer general, General von Thoma, down there and he assessed that the Germans should use four panzer divisions because this is the only thing that was logistically possible and also assumed that, that would achieve victory, but also not to use any Italian troops and get them out because they would logistically wear down because the main problem is basically the port capacity and after that to ship everything on land mm -hmm. transport. Yeah. They weren't there, you need trucks for this. And Germany was not particularly heavy on, on trucks. Horses all the way. Yeah, <laughs> but you can't use them really in the desert. But let's assume now we have the shift, we have one panzer division mm -hmm. like now in mid-October would be arriving there. And we have the redeployment in the Mediterranean and also some mm -hmm. ships. And now let's discuss how the British would react. Well, we should also think about what are the Italians doing until that happens. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. a very good point. This is, this is why I bring in several yeah. guys, because <laughs> you... Yeah. So, the, so what we would assume, let's say, I mean, I would, I mean, the best way probably would to convince the Italians, like, okay, we saw your performance against the French. How you send your divisions, your best divisions or something, to Germany for training? The problem is this might be a a huge prestige issue. Yeah. Uh, so the other way is to basically say, okay, we take care of North Africa, and in 1941 we help you with Greece, and all the other, we, we uh, the, basically the Germans promise the Italians the Balkans, <laughs> which of course Hitler would usually, he hated to give any concessions. So this, he would jump over his shadow, but for, if you, if you take out the political side or only discuss the political side, we're sitting here till mm. five o'clock yeah. and <laughs> nothing's gonna happen. So we assume here a more or less ideal scenario going along. So let's say that the Italians get convinced, more or less, and not that they pull out all of their divisions, but that they don't attack the British before the Germans are there, and that they keep only their a few of the best divisions there and keep them more aligned behind the lines and, and, and take everything, secure yeah. everything. Well, historically, that's what essentially they did with the Air Force, the Italian Air Force. The, most of their best pilots were based in Libya. They lost them um, in the operations that they had because the RAF went very aggressive against the Italians. Just to give you one example, um, when the Italians declared war, they didn't inform their Air Force, which ended up <laughs> being somewhat of a mistake. And really? also, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, really? Um, because the British were ready. They, you know, they 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 knew the uh, the Italians have more planes. Um, that the quality of the aircraft at this point between what the Brits have in the area and the Italians have in the area is very relatively similar. Um, and they have to be that the RAF has to be aggressive, because the Italians. Well, this goes into a little bit of the doctrine and interwar. There was a little bit of a stagnation. They didn't really design a concept on how they're going to use the Air Force, which ended up in, during the war, them being extremely defensive. And in Libya, for example, I mean, we've talked about this before as well, is that they have three choices. Either they, they um, fly patrols over their harbor, or they fly patrols over their own units, or they fly patrols over their own air forts, air, uh, air, airfields. They flew patrols over their own troops, which ended up being a problem because you know, the Navy mm -hmm. or the, the harbors got bombed and the airfields got bombed, which means that the Italian Air Force then had to relocate to airfields that were further in the back and then these got bombed and then it, it got really bad. And I don't really even want to mention Ethiopia because that was 
yeah. in a worse angle. Yeah. Let's keep it your yeah. out because else yeah. it's, it's getting yeah. way too complicated. So what would the how would the British react to the certain scenario we have like now? In mid-October, the Panzer Division arrives and already in early summer they realize, okay, that the Germans also engage more in the Mediterranean on the air mm -hmm. and on the naval side and also the kind of will get from the intelligence that the Germans are planning to ship something here. Yeah. So what would be a naval reaction? Well, historically, the British in 1940 um, are playing fairly aggressively in the Mediterranean. They're, they're obviously, they need to keep Malta resupplied, so they're running convoys to Malta once the Italians are involved. Um, they're also fairly confident in their ability to beat the Italians um, in a fleet engagement. But they're also very conscious of the fact they need to beat the Italians relatively quickly. Um, actually, I, mm. I forgot something. Yes. When the when the Germans relocate their mm. troops yes. and their planes to to the Mediterranean, mm. basically we could assume that they would that the British would declare war on Italy on Italy rather soon. And well, yeah. Off offensive early, I think. The, well, they're they're at war they're at war with Germany. So if German and military units are flying out of Italian territory, it's pretty much a done deal at that point that there is a war on, um, I, would, I would think. But as I say, the, the thing is with, because we mentioned Force H, there's already three battleships and an aircraft carrier, debates about whether Hood's battleship or not can <laughs> another time. Um, yeah. But in the, in the Mediterranean fleet, which is based at Alexandria at the other end of the Mediterranean, um, they've also got War Spite Malaya, Ramillies and Royal Sovereign and Eagle, which is questionably valuable as an aircraft carrier, but you're still talking two carriers, seven capital ships, which is actually half of the Royal Navy's fighting strength in capital ship numbers at that point. That significantly out, outnumbers and outguns the Italian fleet in 1940, which is primarily their old World War I ships. The Littorios are only just beginning to come into service. And the, the British know that the Littorios are modern, fast battleships. So they would much rather face the Italians in a fleet battle on, a, on terms that are vastly favorable to them than wait for Littorio and Vittorio Veneto to show up, at which point it becomes a lot more hit and run. Um, and obviously with the Germans, move, if they're moving significant numbers of troops over to Africa, the easiest way of getting rid of those is to intercept them um, where in, well, they're sailing from Africa, from Italy down to Africa. Uh, Naples, usually. Yeah. yeah. And so it's kind of, in some ways, it's a, on the face of it, it looks like the perfect scenario for the Royal Navy because they can attack when the Italian fleet can try and stand in their way, but probably get steamrolled. Um, but the flip side is obviously, as we were said, that the Luftwaffe can redeploy a lot quicker. And whilst the Italian air, air force was not the world's greatest threat to the Royal Navy in most cases, um, largely because a lot of its aircraft are fairly obsolete. The RAF, use, the Royal Navy, sorry, would use radar and um, its carrier-based fighters, and they would, if you read through the accounts of the Royal Navy at that period in the first couple of years of the war, a lot of days are radar spots, it's shadowing aircraft, yeah. fighter launched, shadowing aircraft shot down. With the kind of recon aircraft the Italians are using, that's pretty easy, even for something like a Fulmar. This um, makes it even worse because the Italian recon aircraft had to land and report what they saw before they could actually mm. tell the Italians because they could radio communication and the Italian Air Force was a novelty. Yeah, um, and then um, with the with the with an increased Luftwaffe presence, you've got Luftwaffe recon aircraft which are faster, higher performance, higher altitude. In the case of something like a Junkers 88, probably has a reasonable chance of actually engaging a full mar <laughs> and winning. Yeah. Um, so the Royal Navy fleet movements are much more likely to be spotted and then actually attacked by um, obviously initially elements of Flieger Corps 10 and any others who happen to be in the area. But Flieger Corps 10, when it historically engaged, was a huge game changer. Yeah. Air attacks went from an annoyance with occasional damage to, ah, right, this could be a major, major uh, problem because this, as we draw towards the end of the year, September, Valiant comes in, so you've got another battleship coming in. Illustrious is coming in as well uh, to the Mediterranean fleet. Um, Barham shows up. It's, the Royal Navy, sort of at this point, when it's only the Scharnhorst they have to worry about in the Northern, Northern Theatre, they're pouring naval units into the Mediterranean Theatre. But of course, we know when Illustrious was caught out by a mixture of 10th Fliegerkorps Corps and, and Italian dive bombers, 
even with its armoured deck, the 1,000 kilogram bombs that the Stukas could carry overmatch it, and Illustrious is sent packing to the shipyards for a very long time. Now, if all of that is coming earlier in the war when the Royal Navy's anti-aircraft capability is less, its radar is less, its, its wartime experience is less, and you've now got a huge amount of Luftwaffe aircraft overhead, you could end up in a scenario where the, the Royal Navy is really pushing to try and stop the Germans getting across, but then it's a coin toss of do the air attacks come off properly or not. If they don't, potentially the Italian fleet gets decimated and a large portion of the reinforcements get sent to the bottom. But given the competency of 10th Liga Corps, it's far more likely that as the Royal Navy chances their arm and gets close to the Italian coastline, even if they've got Illustrious and Eagle, they're only talking about a few dozen relatively low, low capability naval fighters and what, what, what passes for anti-aircraft defence <laughs> in 1940 yeah. versus most of 10th Liga Corps and anyone else who wants to show up for the party. So the Royal Navy potentially could take a fair few losses straight off the bat if they chance it. Now, if they know that 10th Fleet Corps is there, they might you, you, ho okay. hold back and watch, and watch and see what happens. I mean, you don't want to be caught out by Schlachtgeschwader. Yeah. Eins und zwei. Also. I mean, the thing is, I, hope, I, I never read anything that the transfer of the troops to, from Italy to North mm. Africa was actually intercepted, like the, at the 5th Light Division. Mm. Could it be protected very easily because it's rather close on, on the coast? Yeah. Or, um, or was well, there a reason? During the, war, there, during the whole war, there was attempts to interdict mainly the supply lines. And this was obviously a major problem for Rommel going forward. It's, they'd send him new tanks with spare parts or oil, and he'd be waiting for them and turn up, and they wouldn't show up because they'd been sunk. But about um, the initial stuff? The initial stuff, historically, there wasn't a major push made to try and stop Deutsche Afrika Corps coming across, because obviously, historically, that was a little bit later, by which point the Italian fleet and the Luftwaffe presence was such that the Royal Navy was very conscious that Yes, they could, they could play tag with the Italian Navy in most of the Mediterranean, but if you go to that narrow point between kind of Sicily and North Africa, mm. you're inviting pretty much every aircraft that the Axis has to come pouring down upon you, and they know that they won't withstand that. Um, this early in the war, they might chance it because the, the Italian fleet's substantially weaker, but it, I say, it, it depends on whether, how much they know of the Luftwaffe's redeployment. And with the speed the Luftwaffe could redeploy, given the distance between Alexandria and Sicily, you could very well end up in a situation where the Mediterranean fleet starts deploying, and by the time it gets to Sicily, <laughs> Fliegerkorps Corps 10, which wasn't there when they left, is now there, yeah. and that could be a rude surprise. It, it, it's, going to, it's going to come down a lot to intelligence as to what they know of the German movements. Um, personally, I suspect some of the admirals might have liked to. They probably won't. They might send in destroyers by night, in tr and they'll try submarine attacks, but I, I think the majority of the troop movement is still going to get through, at which point they have a major problem on their hands. Although, obviously, then there's the supply lines, but they need a lot more supplies than historical, yeah. which can be interdicted. So from my side, basically, the, the situation for the British was, in summer 1940, was not particularly good with, with what they had at mm. the island, or at the home island. Mm. And for instance, Fennel notes about 340 tanks. I know that uh, some other historians note different numbers. 54 anti-tank guns, and to put this in perspective, I not, I'm not sure if this was a misprint or not, but 54 anti-tank guns is less than a German infantry division has in 1940. I think it's mm. about 75. 420 field guns and 163 heavy guns left to defend the shores of Britain from retreat of imminent invasion. The other thing is, in, in the Middle East, the British forces are also rather limited. They have, like, East Africa, British deployed 40,000 troops, most of them locally. In Egypt, 36,000, and in Palestine, 27,000. Middle East command was made. And I think I have specific numbers for October for, I think, the British? Uh, ah, yeah, here. But, 85 tanks of 12.5 and 14 tons were ready in, in September on British side. The question is, could they redeploy very much more? I don't think so, because there's still some pressure on the home island, mm -hmm. and even if they deploy a bit more, is it enough to match the German division? Yeah, and I mean, if the Germans are keeping up the pressure in northern France, 
we now know that Operation Sea Lion is, is a doomed, doomed attempt, but the <laughs> they don't know that at yeah. the time. So denuding the entirety of the UK of tanks, probably not going to go yeah. over very well. Yeah. And, and the thing is, for, for the Germans redeploying a, a Panzer Corps was not a huge issue at that point because, I mean, they had all the divisions in France or something. So that is not like the British, the UK, there's a major shift mm. here going on. So the home island are a higher priority. So from the mm. army side, the Germans now gain a substantially advantage. The main question here would be probably on the logistical side, what's going mm. to happen? Or did you have anything? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, um, what is your direction of the RF? do you think would be to this change we had, sorry. Um, um, in, you mean in Africa or in yeah, the home in, 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 in general. In so general. now we have now, what we discussed, the, the Germans do the, the shift and everything. Mm -hmm. So what would be the difference for, for, the, for, for the RIF? Um, assuming, I mean, what I've heard out here earlier is that Italy at this point, has Italy already de declared war? It had, we assume that the British basically declare war once the Germans bring right. in the okay. Flieger Corps, I think, and start yeah. hitting Maldor. So if the de British declare war, I mean, they were ready to act when the Italians declared war, the RAF in the, middle, in the Mediterranean. So I assume that if they had the initiative essentially to take that decision, they would immediately send out fighters, bombers, to at least ground the Italian Air Force, which would be given the historical performance in the first couple of days, um, probably they would succeed in doing that. The question then is how much does Italy, given that the Germans have given them reassurances that you know, more is coming, more aviation stuff is coming, how much do they then redeploy to Libya? How much do they pull back? And how much do the Germans actually take advantage of the fact that the Italians are maybe pulling back? So if the, uh, if, the, if the Luftwaffe flies to Sicily and then to Libya and de deploys there, maybe we can save a little bit of the Italian Air Force and keep them in the fight. However, the RAF, given that the fact that they have the initiative, I think that we will see a greater shift of hurricanes towards the theater. Definitely not Spitfires all that much. I'm sure we'll see some of those as well, um, but they will probably be kept in the home Isles as well. Blenheims will keep pouring in. And historically, I think we would, you know, I, I don't want to put really numbers on it, but. It wouldn't surprise me if they would not send double of what they had sent historically in 1940 to the Mediterranean because if the Germans don't keep up the pressure against Britain and you know, engage in a sort of Battle, Battle of Britain, Britain light version, um, then the, yes, of course, the RAF is going to keep a lot back given the fact that there might be that potential for Operation Sea Line, but they, are, they have a lot more leeway, they have a lot more capacity to just send over. So I think we're going to see a very aggressive RAF um, and probably also one that takes a lot more chances with redeploying assets to the Mediterranean. And they're, the, they're the only arm of the British forces that can take that chance yes. yeah. because you can manufacture a new plane in a few months and if you lose a plane you've lost a pilot, that hurts but it's one person. Tanks all the infantry stuff. Well, a tank, obviously, you lose, lose a tank, you lose the crew, theoretically, possibly. Um, but also, as you said, they can fly aircraft in yeah. as reinforcements. Tanks and other bits and pieces, as long as there are hostile forces in central North Africa, you're basically going all the way around Africa. So your logistics for resupply of ground units are hugely slower, yeah. and it takes longer to build a tank anyway. Um, and obviously, with, with the Navy, you're not replacing capital ship losses and aircraft carrier losses if you chance it, and that's thousands of men per loss. So it's just from purely from a mathematical perspective, the, the RAF is the only one you can afford to take any chances yeah. with, and it's also the only one you can resupply any. And they also, speed. I'm not quite sure about the Navy's capacity mm. to repair their fleet in Alexandria. Mm. I'm sure there was some capacity there. Some, but yeah, yeah I mean, Malta had some repair capacity. Right which obviously we'll come on to a bit later. Oh, yes. Alex <laughs> Alexandria had some repair capacity yeah. and um, Gibraltar did. Yeah. The, the main problem was that Alexandria and Malta were both within range of, of bombers. Yeah. So um, we see historically that when, say, Illustrious is damaged or some of the cruisers or even the battleships later on, they get sent out of the theater. Mm -hmm. So anything that's damaged both has to make it out of the theater entirely and then has to either make it somehow back to the UK or over to America depending on what time period it's in. Um, and 
and uh, and then get repaired there and then somehow get back in again. Yeah. So keyword Malta. Yes. Yeah. It's I mean, <laughs> one one issue kind of on the army side is what would the British army do in in North Africa? Mm -hmm. Would they also charge and attack and bring the back the, uh, and drive back the Italians? Mm -hmm. I mean, they did Operation Compass, but I think at that point which was uh, historically in December 1940, they were way better equipped than in summer. Mm. So the question would really be interesting if they push further, because this also comes down from the logistical side. Mm. Tobruk was an Italian port, but when the Africa Corps landed, it was already a British port. And Tobruk has a capacity of about 20,000 tons you can ship in per month, whereas Tripoli had 45,000, which was the main port for the Italians in North Africa. So this, this is quite a substantial difference here. So let's assume for, uh, for the sake of simplicity that the Italians hold on to Tobruk long enough that the Germans get in between, or actually the Germans might ship to Tobruk. Yeah, it's a bit too far yeah. out. It's probably chancing it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as a supply yeah. convoy that's coming down from Italy straight down, yeah, is a yeah. very tough target. A, a supply convoy that's edging into the eastern Mediterranean is a very tempting target, yeah, and it's yeah. kind of this, the balance of who's got the air superiority yeah. and naval superiority starts to shift so, towards the so British. So no troop movements to Tobruk, but likely, probably as they did later, they would ship likely a supplies. Yeah, there. you could get fast, a fast supply ship that maybe is making the run in to arrive at like two, three in the morning could probably make it because once they're in the harbour they can be defended and then sail the next evening yeah. to get out under cover of darkness. I, said, I mean obviously you're, you're the ground expert but I, I suspect that the, the British ground offensive as, as it may be in North Africa would probably be limited more to uh, sort of mobile light columns, um, armoured cars and that kind of thing trying to harass the and... More harassing, yeah. yeah. Which of course brings a slight familial connection because that means my great uncle is going to be charging around in his armoured car, quite happily shooting at Italians for the first part of the war. Which is pretty much what he did historically anyway, but <laughs> he's now going to be alone. <laughs> so, you want to discuss Malta? Well, mm -hmm. I think we have to discuss Malta. Yeah, we have to mm -hmm. discuss Malta. I mean, here's the big issue. Because usually everyone says Malta was the thing why Roma more or less lost or as some of the reasons. I read up what Krefeld noted in his Supplying War and he actually notes, yeah, we look at the loss rates they had and they were actually quite limited. The main problem he argues for North Africa was the port capacity, but even that was quite okay. And after the port capacity, the transportation along the coastlines was the major problem because you need the trucks to have, the railways were in bad mm. shape or sometimes they weren't on at all and the wear and tear on in the desert is way higher. So with the trucks and they needed about, for instance, 10% of the fuel for just supplying that, that they, they could deliver them to the troops. So the question here at all is if an attack on Malta makes sense because it's less of an issue, especially if the Luftwaffe holds it holds it down and if the Germans push as fast as possible to Alexandria because mm. if you have Alexandria the port capacity there is I think quite enormous. Yes yeah well I mean the Alexandria as we said is supporting at one point nearly half a dozen capital units multiple cruisers and multiple destroyer squadrons plus all the resupply pretty much all the resupply for 7th armoured and, and the rest of the desert army plus it's, oh. Ouch. <laughs> plus it's acting as a staging point for various other units. So, um, yeah, this, this is the, the, I mean, the Germans were also quite aggressive, so I would assume they would, <laughs> what, they would, they would just, they, they would probably try to a dash for Alexandria. Mm. And also with the Germans is, on the logistical side, they're more, I, I read up on this historically, basically for the Germans it was always, they were successful despite shorting logistics. This was the thing. It was basically the, the Germans had the few, uh, Gerhard Gross wrote this, that the logistics usually conjured up the proper support at some point. Because if you look at the, in the 19th centuries, the Germans had quite often quite problems with logistics, but they performed still rather well. And I think 
and especially historically also in North Africa, I think Rommel or whoever would be in charge likely would just push for it. The question is, would the British hold long enough and or would the Germans completely run out of their supply mm. lines? But then you also have Tobruk and you can bring in more. Mm. Another aspect here is of course coastal shipping. Yeah. Because I have the capacity for coastal shipping and according to Krefeld it was about 15,000 tons per mm. month. And the question is if the Germans would not also focus bringing more coastal shipping capability because I think they could also ship this to the Mediterranean, but I'm, mm. I don't know how coastal shipping yeah. works out. I, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to try and run a convoy of coastal merchantmen past Force H. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that's an easy way to sort of rack up a lot of kill markings on the side of the Royal Navy. Um, but, but under the cover of the Luftwaffe? The problem is Force H, the, Gibraltar is so narrow, Force H could literally be moored in Gibraltar and shoot across no, no, the straits. No, no, the, the coastal shipping, basically shipping down, um, I don't know, how, how big are coastal ships? Can they, mm. can they use rivers? Uh, any coastal, any ship that could sail, cargo ship that could sail down a river is not one I'd want to sail across the Mediterranean. Okay, so... Um, but, on the other hand, they're small ships. They're relatively quick to build. I mean, we're not talking Liberty ship mass production, but you could, you could if, you, if, if the decision is made to start all this in early 1940, by the time the effort's really getting going uh, in terms of offensive actions, you probably could, in various Italian and former Austro-Hungarian, Austrian, and may, maybe even some of the Greek ports, if that offensive has kicked off by this point, um, you could begin building and requisitioning a lot of coastal shipping. Um, and to be honest, it doesn't take that much more because when Rommel historically got very close to breaking the British, and that's when the British had a lot more forces available and a lot more secure supply lines, there were periods in that in, during those offensives where the British were like, well, one more bad battle and we've got nothing between here and Alexandria. We'd, have, we'd make a final stand at, on the Nile and then we're stuffed. So if you've got significantly more ground forces in there, you could make a fairly decent argument and say, well, actually, if you can build up enough supplies to sustain one big push and just throw everything into it, even, even Luftwaffe transport aircraft, if necessary, to bring up the most vital supplies, uh, the sort of the, the low volume, high importance stuff, if you can shatter the desert army in the western reaches of Egypt, they don't have anywhere to go the sort of Western Egypt is like, well, this just open baked desert. There's nowhere really that makes a good defensive position until you've, you've fallen back to the Nile. And once they've fallen back there, you could operationally pause a little bit, build up enough supplies just to make it across, and then you arrive in overwhelming numbers. And there's not a lot the British can do other than they could probably hold Alexandria for a while, probably mainly on the basis of naval gunfire support, which probably won't do good things to panzers. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. But, but by that point, it would just be a case of, well, how long does it take to bring the Luftwaffe up to, a, to, to the point we could start carpet bombing Alexandria, at which point you, you have to withdraw, that you don't have a choice. I mean, it's the same kind of thing as um, the historical campaigns in Greece and then later with the evacuation of Crete. As long as they're, fight as long as they're fighting infantry and or parts of the Italian Navy, so the ground and naval elements, even if they're being driven back, the British will still fight to the last man. Once the Luftwaffe shows up, the, they, they can't, it's, it's no longer a viable option. As, as with the evacuation of Crete, they can hold on, they can get as many people out, yeah. take horrific losses doing so, but at least with that, they knew they had Alexandria to fall back on. If it's Alexandria that's now the new Crete, um, there is nowhere to fall back. So the, that they, your only choice then is to try and withdraw before some lucky panzer unit gets to the Suez Canal, um, and at which point your next stop is either going to be Aden, which it can't support them, India, which is way out of the way, or Australia. Um, well, I'm sure the Japanese will thank everybody for sending half the Royal Navy to Australia, but there you go. Um, this is yeah. actually an important point to mention here. Yeah, I looked up the, the Battle of Crete a bit, um, where the Luftwaffe landed the uh, Fajimiega, and basically they ran into... The British knew that they were coming. The, they had major problems with landing and everything, and everything went good, but then the British broke. And the question is why? 
And they had actually a report, and it was Weston's report, and to quote Fennell here, much like that of Bartholomew committees, stress the more rather material impacts of air power. At Melamy, after several days of strafing, only one NCO had been killed and three other ranks wounded. The effect produced on the troops, he said, appeared out of all proportions to the actual damage inflicted. And this is something which is also discussed in my Stuka and Panzer video. So basically, at this point, early on in the war, 1940, 1941, air, air superiority or something, or close air support, the infantry basically gives up. And this would likely happen there similarly, I assume, in the desert to a certain degree. Mm. So they don't kill very much, but the, the morale just takes oh, yes. a nosedive, yeah. basically does a dive bomb. Yeah, and, and, and un, unlike practically anywhere else in the European theater where fighting is going on, if you're an infantryman fighting in the desert, if you're being shot at by infantry or a tank or anything, there's plenty of sand dunes to hide behind. If there's aircraft, there is nowhere to hide. Yeah. Um, they can see you wherever you go, um, even on the coast where there's a little bit more cover. It's nowhere near the level of cover in Europe where you can dive into a ditch, hide under a hedge, buildings, trees, etc. The feeling of being exposed is yeah. just that was huge. There by Fennel as well. He mm. was like, I think he was quoting some some aspects, and they were always like freaking out when once they saw an aircraft, they always assumed they were spotted or something, which mm. is like okay, and later on this I assume was fixed mostly but we are still early in the war mm. so the question is can we assume that the Germans take Alexandria or not or should we discuss the Malta situation well I think I think it would make sense for them to to go for Malta because even compared to Crete Malta is a much smaller target yes Valletta is heavily defended but most of the rest of Malta isn't and well, as you say, the, the number of losses inflicted directly by Malta is relatively small, but it's very irritating, yeah. and they don't necessarily have to hit everything, because if they've got one, one supply ship that's just carrying loads of spare parts for the Panzers, if they hit that ship, I mean, yeah, it's yeah. roll of the dice, but hit that ship, and that's potentially operations crippled for months. So, and you've got not only the aircraft, but you've got a lot of the submarines basing out of the Grand Harbour as well. Um, yep. And it's also the other thing is it's also a vital supply link for the Mediterranean fleet because the way the Mediterranean fleet cycles damaged units out and gets fresh units in is usually Force H sails with a convoy from, from Gibraltar, the Mediterranean fleet comes up in support and they kind of swap ships in the middle of the chaos and confusion that is the merchants heading into Malta and then go their separate ways again. Cut Malta out and there's now very little, if any, ability to resupply and restock the Mediterranean fleet and take its damaged ships out away again, short of going around the entirety of Africa, which adds months to the to, to the logistics. I assume also the Italians wanted for prestige regions, probably. Well, yeah, but I mean, Malta has potential. That's the thing. Yeah. I mean, when when the war starts into the Mediterranean, Malta's potential is not yet realized, but it does have an RDF station that's it's starting to get a radar. It's a place. In the middle between Sicily and Libya, yeah. closer to Sicily, of course. Um, so, for example, also for a logistical reason for the Germans or for the for the Axis, it would be make sense to have Malta. Um, or if you, for example, have a flight going from Sicily to Libya, and some technical problems occur, yeah, to land there, you can land also with ships, yeah. which, you know, have a higher chance of actually finding an airport, and. The fact that Malta still has communication, RDF, that would also be RDF um, installation, that would be good for the RDF if it ever you know, is able to hit the, the supply runs. Um, our Malta is just, at the beginning it's not a hard factor, but it's a soft factor that very much becomes a hard factor, historically speaking. So taking that away would help. The problem is how, much, how many men do you need? I mean, theoretically the Germans were speaking of dropping paratroopers on it. Um, and I think they, they spoke about between 20 to 40,000 men in total um, over three different attack runs. Um, so for Crete, they basically attacked with, an, with, a, with a paratroop division and then they took airfields and then they flown in a, a, a mountain mm -hmm. division. Yeah. Similar. Yeah. The, the plans for Malta were very similar. And the Italians, of course, had plans since 1938, but they were more sort of theoretically, what should we do? And, how much, you know, how much is our capacity, and, and it was, I think, also more of a seaborne invasion than actually an aerial invasion. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you could pair those together, I think Malta would fall relatively 
quickly, mm. as long as you also prepare to then take it hold the island. I don't think the Brits would really have the capacity to launch a counterattack or to no. retake it. And so it, maybe it's going to be, you know, a week of heavy fighting paired with a little bit of guerrilla action in the end because Malta does have you know, some mountainous mm. terrain. And I guess some lads would take their rifles and go mm. into the mountains. And there's a, two islands, two big islands, Gozo Gu mm. and then Malta itself. Camino, I guess, would have to be taken as well. But you know, we're talking yeah. about peanuts at that point when they yeah. have the actual island. And historically, the defenses were very stretched. Yeah. Um, the, oh, the, one of the reasons for the supply convoys, well, the supply convoys were to Malta because they kept running out, obviously. Um, but it was also um, resupplies of men, resupplies of ammunition, resupplies of aircraft, um, and I say, although they had some repair cap capacity in the Grand Harbour, um, historically you had ships like HMS Penelope, so it sails in for repairs and actually takes more damage from incidental, incidental shrapnel hits from the bombs that land around it and goes in, replaces its gun barrels, wears out all of its gun barrels shooting at the aircraft that are attacking it while in port, so it needs another set of gun barrels just from its activities in port. So that gives you some idea just how much pressure Malta's under it in the, in the early part of the war. So if there's more aircraft coming in, um, and obviously those aircraft are also able to interdict the resupply convoys a lot more, so there's less supplies coming to Malta and, and more, and attack, the attack happening earlier, and there's even more pressure on Malta generally, it, it may well even start running out of supplies and be forced, be forced into a situation of s surrender or starve, depending on how well the air operations against the resupply convoys go. But even if they've just about got enough to continue holding out, their ability to fight back against any kind of air mass attack is going to be severely degraded. And for all that I'm sure they'll put up the best fight they can, I can't really see anything um, happening. I mean, the, the only scenario where it possibly goes really badly wrong is if some, somebody decides it's a really bright idea to drop the Valstrom Jäger right over the Grand Harbour into the teeth of the anti-aircraft defence. But I can't see them being that stupid. There's enough of Malta that you can quite happily drop Valstrom Jäger units with minimal opposition and then form up and... They make, they make Crete actually look... Well, Crete would be a lot worse historically than yeah. Malta probably would be. Okay, then... By the way, I, I just saw in my basic structure, mm. I missed some important aspects. Third parties, basically um, Italy, Spain, and Soviet Union, Greece, and Yugoslavia, yeah, we keep them mostly out for, mm -hmm. for simplicity reasons, because if you then also account what would the Soviet Union do, and Spain, and Greece, it, yeah, it gets mm. even more complicated. Now, okay, Malta has fallen. The Germans can make it to Alexandria. The question is now, can the British frag the harbor there to make it, or the port to make it not usable, or is this nearly impossible? They can destroy the, they can destroy the, in, the dockside infrastructure. I mean, things like crane or warehouses can be set on fire. Cranes, you can put demolition charges and blow them into the water. Um, it depends on how fast Alexandria is taken. If it's a case of you, they've, they've broken the desert force, but they're now rest of resupply, and it's obvious that this is what's going to happen next, then there probably will be a whole-scale kind of destruction of the port infrastructure. Um, if that battle actually goes stupendously badly for the British and someone takes a chance and just goes, right, we're just following them, the possibility that they might not com completely do it, but ultimately, Alexandria is a huge port. It goes back millennia. Um, the, the name gives a clue as to who founded it, obviously. Um, and you, I mean, short of sinking a cup, maybe a few damaged warships as block ships in the in the in the approaches. But even then, the approaches are quite large. There's not a tremendous amount you can do to remove the utility of it as a as a geographic location. Um, I say, sure, you can take out cranes and stuff, but all, all taking out the cranes means is that you can bring in supplies that have to be offloaded by hand. And that only lasts until you can bring in replacement cranes and build replacement warehouses. You can't destroy the piers, the jetties, or somehow magically silt up the entire harbour. That's, that's still going to be there. And once you can bring supplies into Alexandria, there's no way the British can hold anywhere else, the rest of Egypt or Suez or anything. Um, because the, the Germans basically at that point have supplies right there for the taking, and the British are at the other end of a, a supply line that wraps around the entire continents. 
um, at which point they, they have to fall back. Quite where they fall back to, I don't know. They probably have to fall back into Meso what was then Mesopotamia and probably be taken, taken off by ship as they be either back to India or Australia or really long journey back to the UK around the entirety of continental Africa. But, and then, of course, the, the, the big O, the oil, yeah. is left open. Um, should we, do we want to go on to that? I think we're... I think... Do a, like, in a few minutes? Yeah, a few minutes. Basically okay, what? so, obviously, historically, we know the Germans have problems with oil, uh, mostly relying on the Romanian fields and some artificial production, um, and a few other bits and pieces. Um, compared to Romanian oil, um, so, obviously, America is the biggest oil producer. It's 10 times more oil than the next largest producer. So the Allies aren't running out of oil anytime soon. But the Romanian oil fields at this point, they're producing about 7 million tons of oil a year. Um, Iran alone is producing 10 million tons, or what we would today call Iran. Uh, Iraq's another two thirds of Romania's capacity, and what we would today call Bahrain. There are some oil fields in Egypt as well, and what we call Saudi Arabia, it's about another third. So in theory, taking the Middle East increases total access oil production if you take Romania as the bulk of it historically by about 250 percent. Um, so they then no longer got, because Kriegsmarine no longer has any um, a fuel concerns. Um, you could probably line up a, a, you could probably make like crocodile versions of tigers and run them with their flamethrowers constantly going all the way up to Moscow and not miss it. Um, the only thing you have to balance that with is that those oil fields are quite far away. And there's not a lot the British can do to defend them, but they do have the time to sabotage them. Um, so the production is probably going to be down. Obviously, you can reinstate that. The other two things is how do you transport that back to Europe and how much refining capacity have you got? Because yeah. it's all very well saying we now have 20, mil 20, 25 million tons of oil per year, but if your refinery <laughs> capacity is only 12 million tons, that's how much petroleum product you're getting. Okay. Well, I think that's a pretty good final point, mm. rounding it all up. So basically, let us know in the comment section. Of course, we took on the political side, on the diplomatic side, we took the cheap way out because, well, it's really a mess in there. And we might overlook something on the army side. I think on the Luftwaffe and also on the naval side, we are pretty strong. So let us know what you think in the comment section. Also be sure to subscribe to Drachmina's channel and of course to Military Aviation History's channel. So thank you for watching and see you next time. Big thank you here to the Tank Museum at Bovington for inviting us to Tankfest 2019. Also a big thank you here to Philip for helping us out at Tankfest. Thank you for watching and see you next time.